Well before his legendary third fight with Frazier, Muhammad Ali had been showing an interest in martial arts outside of boxing, even going so far as to train extensively with Jun Ri, nowadays considered the father of American Taekwondo. It made sense, Ali had done all he could to prove that he was, after all, the greatest of all time in his own sport. Now he looked to explore other styles of fighting, and so, Ali arranged for a mixed style match against a prominent Japanese wrestler by the name of Antonio Inoki, but Ali promptly nicknamed him the Pelican. At first, most assumed that the match would be completely and totally fake. And in fact, there are various stories and accounts about exactly how real the match was supposed to be when the deal was first hammered out. Some close to Ali say that it was supposed to be a fix, and then Ali changed his mind weeks before the fight because he felt bad about tricking his fans. Others hold that Ali at first wanted a real, no-holds-barred fight, with absolutely everything allowed, but changed his tune when he saw Anoki practicing his terrifying kicks. Whatever actually happened in the lead-up, the result was a very real match with a very interesting set of rules. Put simply, Ali would be allowed to box, and Anoki would be allowed to wrestle. Ali could win by KO, and Anoki could win by pinning Ali to the ground for three seconds. If Anoki managed to get on top of Ali, Ali could escape by simply touching one of the ropes, and then fighting would continue on the feet. Refereeing the fight was Judo Jean LaBelle, who himself had been the first man to participate in a multi-style bout on television. That fight had offered a fascinating glance into how a wrestler could evade punches in order to get close enough to submit his opponent. In fact, LaBelle had choked out his competitor on live television. Inoki himself did not have to submit Ali, only pin him. And to get him to the ground, he was allowed the use of body locks, sweeps, reaps, and hip throws. In a way, it harkened back to the London prize rules of the 1800s, before boxing became more modernized and limited grappling. It would of course be fascinating to see how Ali, someone who was a skilled grappler in regards specifically to boxing, dealt with Anoki's attempts to get him to the ground. Depending on how Anoki did, the bout had the potential to skyrocket the popularity of wrestling, showcasing an, at the time, more obscure branch of martial arts that was not taken too seriously by the general public. Perhaps it could even usher in a new era of mixed martial arts, where different styles were put to the test against each other resulting in new, innovative techniques and strategies. But obviously, this is not what happened. What did happen was one of the most bizarre, ludicrous, and yes, sadly real spectacles in combat sports history. The night came. Having no way of knowing the oddity they were about to witness, the crowd cheered as the first bell sounded the start of the 15 round fight. Wasting no time, Inoki leaped through the air and threw a terrifying kick at Ali before falling down on his side. The show had opened with a bang, and spectators, already hazy on the rules, were left confused. From there, Inoki butt-scooted across the ring, kicking at Ali's legs. This left everybody asking one simple question. What in the actual f was going on? The answer was due to the inclusion of a last second rule, seen as more of a footnote by Ali's team. It had been agreed upon that Inoki was allowed to throw kicks at Ali while on the ground, presumably to give him some chance of recourse if Ali jumped on top of him and began to rain down blows while he was already dazed. But now, hesitant to risk taking punches, Inoki decided it was best to represent his sport by... doing this. Ali, unsure of what to do, simply jumped away from Inoki while shouting insults, trying to incense him into standing up and using his wrestling, which of course was the whole point of the fight. But Inoki would not stand up, and this bizarre spectacle was to continue unabated until the fourth, when Ali came up with a new strategy. He let himself get pinned in a corner, and then used the ropes to lift himself up, stomping down on Inoki. But LaBelle stopped Ali, telling him that this was against the rules. Meanwhile, Inoki kicked between LaBelle's legs to nail Ali during the break. And then, once again, the butt scooting continued. In the sixth, Inoki began to target Ali's groin. Later in the sixth, Inoki used another illegal tactic, 
grabbing Ellie's foot and sweeping him. Anoki was at least using wrestling here, but it was one of the very few ways that were illegal for him to take Ellie down. The crowd cheered, happy for some action at last. But Anoki had no control of Ali, and the greatest managed to hook his leg on the rope, prompting LaBelle to stand the two fighters up. Annoyed at losing his chance, Anoki thought the best course of action for him to take was to illegally elbow Ali in the face. Like a younger brother who keeps spamming the low kick button in the arcade, Anoki had found a tactic that kept him completely safe, but relentlessly piled small amounts of damage on his opponent. And although his kicks were nowhere near as powerful as a full-fledged standing roundhouse to the leg, the damage was beginning to add up. This was in no small part due to the fact that Anoki was wearing hard leather shoes with brass rivets on the end of them. But still, Ali was not going down, or quitting. By round 10, the crowd was screaming at Anoki to fight fair. It was clear to everyone that Anoki was not interested in pitting wrestling against boxing. If he had had foreknowledge of the future, if he had had access to a catalog of future fights, he no doubt might have felt comfortable pitting his wrestling against Ali's boxing. But for now, he was content exploiting an obscure loophole in the rules. And as Ali began to slow, it looked like it might actually work. But luckily for Ali, he had brought Jun Ri with him to Japan. Ri got Ali's attention between rounds and told him to simply low block the kicks. This tactic proved effective, and over the coming rounds, helped greatly to reduce the damage to Ali's lead leg. But then, in the 13th, spurred on by his furious coach, Inoki actually tried to wrestle. But Ali had pretty much given up on trying to box at this point, or in fact, get anywhere near Inoki for obvious reasons. That meant that Inoki could not use Ali's punches to close the distance or tie up his arms, as LaBelle had in his fight. Inoki had handicapped himself by his refusal to risk taking punches, and had to shoot in with no setup, ironically taking a hard punch to the face as he entered. Despite this, Inoki actually managed to get between Ali and the ropes in a prime position to take the champion to the center of the ring and throw him to the mat. But Inoki stayed stationary as he adjusted his grip, giving Ali ample time to wrap his arms around the ropes and prompting LaBelle to call a break. Inoki now tried a second time, body locking Ali and looking to throw. This time he got even closer, but once again, just in the nick of time, Ali wrapped one arm around the ropes, collar tied Inoki, and leaned all of his weight on top of him. Intent on finally showing his wrestling prowess, Inoki regrouped and stood with Ali in the center of the ring. He let Ali fire on him, but used his punches against him to secure holds. Inoki then lifted the champion over his head and slammed him into the center of the ring. Is what I would have liked to have said. Inoki gave up on wrestling for the remainder of the bout, and instead decided that the best course of action was simply to knee Ali in the groin. Ali, understandably, decided to leave, having experienced far too many shots to the groin for one day, but LaBelle talked him into finishing the fight. Now Inoki tried standing kicks. There was no loophole for this, it was entirely illegal, but Ali and his corner actually welcomed it, as it finally gave Ali a chance to box. But after taking just two jabs flush to his face, Inoki abandoned this idea as well, and went back to his usual activities. And that was pretty much the most interesting thing to happen until the last round of the fight. Near the end of the 15th, Ali countered one of Inoki's leaping kicks with a hard jab, causing him to slam into the mat. But he chose not to pursue the action, and Inoki simply stood back up. Then, thankfully, it was all over. Both Ali and Anoki returned to their lives, and the fight was mostly forgotten for years. Ali vs. Anoki pitted the most famous and beloved sports figure in the world against a martial art that was, at the time, seen as kind of a joke. It was a rare opportunity to pit a different style against a ready and willing boxer, and one greatly squandered by a fighter too scared of Ali to showcase the best of his art form. As we now all know, wrestling, and most other forms of grappling, are highly effective, and each have their place and unique uses in fighting. But at that moment in history, this is not what the world had seen. 
Ali concluded that Inoki spent his time butt scooting around the ring because a wrestler must not be capable of beating a boxer when beginning from an upright position, and most people watching came to the same erroneous conclusion. Equally devastating to the world of combat sports, this was now many fans and practitioners' introduction to leg kicks. Ali had taken 107 kicks to the legs, a fact that would later result in Ali being hospitalized for blood clots and requiring blood thinners. In fact, Junri's timely advice to Loblock could potentially have saved Ali's life. But Ali had a great poker face, and many walked away from the broadcast bemused at the idea of kicking someone's legs to try to hurt them. How ridiculous. Ali walked away from the fight with a third of the money he'd been promised, and the world missed out on what would have perhaps been a new age of mixed martial arts. But of course, this age would eventually come. And this was thanks, in some part, not to the two fighters in the ring, but to the man refereeing them. Jean LaBelle would go on to help teach Bruce Lee grappling, who in turn began to introduce it to audiences through his movies. And decades later, one of LaBelle's students would play a major role in bringing MMA into mainstream consciousness. But that was all in the future. For now, Ali prepared for his third fight with the great Ken Norton. Thanks for watching. From the Modern Martial Artist, this has been David Christian. Wishing you happy training.